Here we go. What's up, Periscope? Thanks for checking us out. Facebook Live, always appreciate it. Everybody, it's Ted DiBiase, the Million Dollar Man, and you're listening to the Wrestle Talk Podcast. Without the night out, tune in to WrestleTalk, 657-383-1521. We'll be discussing WWE. NXT, Lucha Underground, ROH, Fantasy Wrestling, and we'll have some of the best damn interviews for professional and independent wrestling that you've ever heard. And I'm Joe Lamb. Ladies and gentlemen, buckle your seatbelts, keep your arms in the vehicle at all times. Wrestling Talk begins in five, four, three. Two, one, enjoy the ride. Go with okay. What is up, what is up, what is up, what is up, what is up? Ladies? Yes, we are. We're going to be covering uh, New Japan uh, in depth next week. Uh, so stay tuned. I'm really excited about G1, dude. Freaking dope. Dope. That's all I got to say. That means one thing and one We're live. thing only. Thank you guys for tuning in. Tap the screen, the share it, man. Podcast, Greatly man. appreciate it. The Western Talk Podcast with Joe and Renee. And boy, do we have a show for you tonight. Without any further ado, let me go ahead and bring in the man, the myth, the legend, the Night Owl. Unmuted. Buenas noches and good evening to all of our friends out there. Members of the Wrestle Talk family, it is your boy the Night Owl checking in once again. It is Wednesday, 7:02 p.m. Central Time. We are grateful and we are happy to have you here, Nightmare Jones. We got a lot going on in today's show, man. So let's kick it off right away, bro. How are you doing tonight? I am doing good. I'm doing good. I cannot complain. Well, cool. I know you were a little under the weather, man. Are you bouncing back? You feeling better? Uh, yes, I am. I, I I am definitely feeling a little bit, uh, feeling better, so I am ready to go. Dude, that's fantastic. All right, well, uh, we just want to go ahead and remind everybody uh, our very favorite way uh, to interact with you folks is over the phone, so feel free to give us a call by dialing 657 Five two one again. That's six five seven three eight three one five two one. We want to hear from you, especially early in the show. We're going to be doing what we call our high spot segment and covering some hot topics in professional wrestling. But we will be obligated to cut it a little short because we have three guests in the first hour. They're all going to join us, join us simultaneously as we are doing something we've been planning on doing for quite a while. And uh, and that is the St. Louis announcers roundtable. We're going to be joined by Ben Simon of uh, NWSTL slash NWLKC and MMWA South Broadway, uh, Drew Abenhaus of SICW, our friends over uh, over there, and Herb Simmons uh, that always do a fantastic job, been doing it for over 30 years, and of course, our amigo, our friend, our partner in crime, Luke Roberts of Dynamo Pro Wrestling will all be a part of the show in the first hour today, and of course, the second hour, we're going to have the volatile Curtis Wild, who's a man who's been very successful successful for over 15 years here in the region. He's been in Kansas City. I mean, he's really been all over the place. It's hard to kind of pin everything down that he's done. But I'm pretty damn excited about what we got going on today, Nightmare Jones. In addition to, uh, we're going to be doing Tweet of the Week. We're going to be doing Shoot and Shout. We're going to be doing the FWWC segment, uh, Snippets of Truth with Big Daddy P. And then, of course, everyone's favorite, the Wrestle Talk Game Show Challenge. But... Out of respect to time, Nightmare Jones, let's do what we always do about this time. Keep it official like a referee with a golden whistle by paying homage to the greatest country on God's green earth. And that's America, damn it. I see you, Jay Hollywood. What's up, man? Hey, Anthony, bro, thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate the support. Hope we do have a great show. Right? <laughs> oh, 
Uh oh. Uh oh. I'm making a for it now. Oh, the land, the land of, of the free. Thanks for tuning in my eye every single time. Every single time, indeed. Nightmare Jones, man. We're going to have our guests on joining us here in about 10 minutes, man. But I know that there was a couple of things that you wanted to address on high spots, man. So why don't you go ahead and take the floor, brother, because I know you're pretty damn hot. You're pretty damn upset about it. And I think the members of the WrestleTalk family have the right to know what the heck is pissing you off today. Absolutely. But shouldn't we be on Vandas first? Well, hey, absolutely. My apologies. Go ahead and give her a nice introduction and let's do this thing. Ladies and gentlemen, joining us for the high spots tonight is a person that is no stranger to the Retro Talk podcast. We have the one, the only, Brandis. What's up? How's it going, Brandis? What's up, you Brandis? Hey, <laughs> yo, yo, yo. What's going on? Hey, Nothing much, just chilling in KC. I hear you, I hear you. Alright, so I'm going to go ahead and jump right into this because this is a little bit long, but I'm, I'm going to try to make it as short as I possibly can. Um, About a year ago, I started seeing this post on my Facebook for some uh, uh, festival. It's a country music and professional wrestling festival called West Virginia... Uh, the weekend in the country. Uh, this guy, he had all these these big country names that were going to be there, and then you also had wrestling that was going to be there, and you had all these big names. I mean, I'm talking Scott Hall, Kevin Nash, uh, X Pac, Sid Justice, The Bushwhackers, Animal from Legion of Doom, Greg the Hammer, Valentine, Brutus the Barber, Beefcake, um, Big Sean Stud, uh, The Powers of Pain, Demolition, they were all supposed to be there signing autographs. And it seems... Yo, what up, Joey? Thanks for checking us out, man. I appreciate you being here, man. Tap that screen. And share this broadcast, bro. We're getting into some serious conversation right now, bro. Some shady promoters might want to tune in and listen to this. Apparently, this promoter is well known for, uh, both for, uh, putting on wrestling shows and announcing big talent to be at the shows and then the day of the show he announces that that person is not going to be there so you know he, he's kind of shady but everybody gave him the benefit of the doubt and sure enough about two weeks before the show was supposed to go all of their uh, websites they went down for maintenance I mean I'm talking about West Virginia Regan in the country dot com dot net dot org. You name it, every single one of them went down for for maintenance. And then this weekend, which the show was supposed to be this weekend, he puts out a post on Facebook stating that uh they have have spent a lot of, of money and they weren't able to get generate the amount of tickets that they wanted to, blah, 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 and they had to file for bankruptcy, and the show is not going to be going on at this time. They hope to have the show on some other time, maybe at another venue. If they have any, any issues, contact his attorney, and he only gives his attorney's name, no number, no address. It's just really, 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 really shady, if you ask me. Terrible. Just, just, just wow. the worst. The, just the worst side of wrestling. But before I give my thoughts, Brandon, I, I gotta. You know, you've been involved with with a, a professional wrestling promotion, not just on one occasion, but I believe on two separate occasions, and have had some pretty different experiences. I gotta know. What do you think? What are your thoughts on on uh, this situation that Joe's brought to our attention? Um. I mean, I would just say it's kind of like with any promotion that you go into, um, whether they seem reputable or not, and with any event, I would urge, uh, first of all, a lot of people, but when they are spending their money, it's always going to be buyer beware. You know, um, do your research, 
check in with uh, BBB, Better Business Bureau, if you guys don't know that. Um, but, it's, I mean, stuff like that, you just it just seems like you can't avoid. Um, even though they have good intentions, I mean, it's still that kind of, um, oh, what is it? It's kind of like that trust kind of thing that you, that you really have to uh, watch out for. Because uh, people can, like, with Joe's experience or what he's, what he's seen is, uh, you know, people are really shady. And I don't know. Like, that, that's just really messed up how they, do, how they did that. Um, yeah, total <coughs> straight up buyer beware. Well, yeah, that's that's great advice uh, from Brandis. And again, you know, you do have the ability to to uh, you know to check out the Better Business Bureau, see what what's being said. Uh, I'm not a guy that's going to take reviews uh, to heart necessarily, but you know, if you go to that person's page or a previous event, and you know, you go through and you read some of the comments uh, from people that actually went to the event, because those things don't disappear. Typically, if there's an event. Uh, you know that that thread will stay up whether it's under a poster or a video or something that was made to promote an event and then after that event closes or it's over some people that had a bad experience will go back in and comment say hey this was nothing like what I expected uh, it didn't happen the way that they told me it yeah. would so yeah definitely do buyer beware do your due diligence and like us here at the Russell Talk podcast you know we we have the privilege of working with some of the best businesses in the country, some of the best promotions in the country without a shadow of a doubt. I mean, even, you know, PaintersDream.com, who does our website work, you know, we, we're, we're good friends with Perry. And, and we, we knew right off the bat that he was going to be somebody that we we're going to be able to work with because his Better Business Bureau rating is above 90. So, I mean, honestly speaking, I think I think it's a shame. I think it gives wrestling a bad name. And I think that some people may, may feel burned by that. And you may have just potentially turned off somebody that would have inevitably become a serious wrestling fan completely off to the business altogether um, for the sake of making a couple of bucks. And, I, and honestly, I think it's sad and, and it's damn right flat out embarrassing that somebody would go to those lengths to try to rip people off. I mean, it's, it's just kind of bull crap if you ask me. You know, and you know what, Renee, like adding to that, what people don't realize is that it not only gives wrestling a bad name, but it gives future people or promotions that are wanting to do business at festivals or anything uh, a bad rep, too. Because now that whoever is in charge of the festival or who allows the wrestling to happen there is not going to want to probably do business, you know? Yeah, I agree, and, and, and I agree completely. The worst part about it was this guy was collecting money for tickets for like 18 months at like $80 a pop. That's ridiculous. That's absolutely ridiculous. Yeah, it is. And, and you know what? I'm gonna, yeah. I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna dare to go off on a quick tangent here. I, I think that this situation is is somewhat isolated. I know it's probably happened many times before, but it's not something you hear about all the time. So I'm gonna kind of veer off the track here just for a second. I think something that is not quite as bad but but is just as disrespectful and I and it came to my mind just now because I saw it uh, a few days ago online is promoters that are expecting to be able to pay the talent with the money that they make from the door. Uh, if you're a promoter, you need to have that money already in your pocket ready to go no matter how the show goes because if your show does not perform let's just leave it at that if your show does not perform the workers are minimally responsible i'm not going to say they're not responsible at all because we've had this conversation before if you're a wrestler that's going to be a part of a show you have a certain amount of responsibility yourself to make sure that you're publicizing it and sharing the posters and you know doing facebook lives hey guys next saturday i'm going to be here i'm going to be there we hope that most guys will take heed to that and understand that yes it may not be your promotion but you're going to be working at that show and anything you can do to make it a better show is only going to raise your stock but with that being said right the promoter has to make sure that all his t's are crossed and dies are added i i have been to a show and been involved in a show where at the end of the show the promoter was basically crossing his fingers 
praying to God that they'd made enough from the door to be able to pay the guys. And since that did not happen, he did not draw enough at the show to be able to pay the guys. He had to send somebody to the ATM to get money out of his personal account to pay the guys uh, the money that they were promised. OK, so I think if you're oh, going Lord. to do this, yeah, if you're going to do this, you need to do this for real, because the next time that you try to do it, guess what people are going to say? Yeah, no way I'm driving across the state. No way I'm going into another city to potentially have to wait an hour and a half because you didn't make enough at the gate so that somebody can run to the ATM and get the money out so that I can so that I can be paid. The guys deserve more respect than that. And flat out, it's, it goes along the same lines of what you're talking about, Joe. Not all promoters are shady, okay? Some of them, I think, have good intentions. But if you're unprepared and unprofessional, it's just as bad as being shady. You know why? Because you're not practicing business with a level of integrity that is going to earn you respect in the wrestling community. Because wrestling fans are fickle. And if you do not take care of them off the jump, they will quickly move on to something else. Then you don't have the right to you know, cry and complain about why you don't have people coming through the door. When the last time you did a show, you basically made everyone leave there with a bad taste in their mouths. Can we all agree on that? Yep. All right, so Absolutely. yeah, so just real quick, hey, what's up, everybody? Checking us out on Facebook. I appreciate you being here. Please share the broadcast, tap the screen. Greatly appreciate it. Um, last thing, we're getting ready to move on to this St. Louis announcers roundtable. I'm very, very excited about that. Um, last thing, I want to ask you guys, and it can be a one-word answer, whatever. Just let's try to make it quick. Um, the Punjabi Hell in the Cell match. Are you digging that? Number one. <laughs> And and number two, uh, what did you guys think about LeVar Ball showing up on Monday Night Raw? Let's start with the lady first, Brandis. Honestly, I well for the first thing, the Punjabi thing, um, I'm glad it's back. Um, I haven't seen that in a while. The second one, um, no, I I didn't really watch that part, so I have no opinion on that. Well, you saved yourself a lot of trouble. I'm glad. <laughs> At least you were smart enough to not watch that trash. Joe, your thoughts? Um, the Punjabi number one, I was like, I was worried that they were going to go that route. Like, I wasn't, I've never been a big fan of the Punjabi uh, match. Uh, it, it just seems kind of not really exciting to me. Um, but plus, also, I, I'm not excited about seeing Randy Orton against Jinder Mahal for a third time and a third pay-per-view in a row. Um, and as for LeVar Ball, I didn't know who the hell the guy was. <laughs> I, I, I don't really like Ball, so I didn't know who this guy was. And he comes out acting like an idiot and, you know, I guess he was for a comedy scene. And then WWE gets into uh, a little bit of trouble because... His, I think it was 16-year-old son said the uh, the N-word not once but twice live on Monday Night Raw. <laughs> <laughs> oh. The funniest part is he was referring to the whitest guy in America, The Miz. <laughs> That's the funniest part about it, I think. Good grief. It, it, was, it, was absolutely, it was absolutely a train wreck. And just my closing statement here before we move on to our guests... Um, this is the kind of bit that makes wrestling lose credibility. It, when you bring in the John Stewart's, when you lev, when you let David Arquette win your heavyweight championship, and when you let Lavar Ball come in and basically act like he's at the circus, I think it was um, it, it was just disgraceful. And, and our buddy Kronos here is telling us that they didn't even bother to put it in the Hulu version of Monday Night Raw. So I think that was probably a good thing for those who end up watching the show on Hulu. So, yeah, just a train wreck. Please spare us. I would have done much better uh, with Miz and Maurice arguing during Miz TV and then Dean Ambrose coming back out and, you know, hitting him with the finisher one more time. Because, yeah, that's just unnecessary. You're talking reality error. You're talking about credibility. 
when you're talking about going mainstream, I get trying to bring the big names in, but please don't bring somebody in that's going to embarrass the product because we all know, for those who follow along, LeVar Ball is a guy that on a very regular basis embarrasses himself. Last time I saw him, he was like being disrespectful to some co-host on the Colin Cowherd show, so you already knew that there was a good chance that it was going to be a train wreck. And in, in just a span of a couple of weeks, we've seen some pretty horrible segments. When you're talking about Alexis Bliss, this is your life. And then when you move along to, uh, you know, something like this, I'm just like, dude, please, I, I could have done without those 15 minutes. Honestly, it didn't do anybody any favors, and it totally fell flat. But, guys, with that being said, Brandis, we appreciate you being here. It is time for us to move on to the very first feature segment of the day with the St. Louis Announcers Roundtable. We love you, Brandis, and we can't wait to see that blog you're working on. Thank you, guys. Peace out. Peace. Peace. There's our girl, Brandis Outlaw. Man, you'll find her at independent wrestling shows pretty much everywhere. St. Louis, Kansas City. If you go to shows, you're going to find Miss Outlaw. She will be there, and she will be one of the loudest people in the building. No doubt about that. All right, Nightmare, are we ready to move on? Yes, we are. Yes. Yes, we are. Hold on one second. There you go. All right, let's go ahead and bring on. Why don't you tell us who our guests are? So Dude. we can bring them on one by one. Absolutely. All right, first and foremost, let's bring on a man who you can hear uh, on a semi regular basis here on the Wrestle Talk podcast. Our friend, our amigo from Dynamo Pro Wrestling, Luke Roberts. Well, Renee, Joe, thank you for having me once again on the Wrestle Talk podcast. You had a lot of great, a lot of great discussion there in the high spots, and it's definitely my honor and privilege to be here tonight, not only with you, but my broadcast colleagues here in the same. It's going to be a great time here on Wrestle Talk tonight. Oh, it is going to be a great time, and I, you know, I was telling Joe before the show, hey, with the three guys we got coming on, there's a good chance that we may ask one question, and you guys just take and run with it for 40 minutes. So that's, I'm actually looking forward to that because I know you guys. Our old buddies and, and broadcast colleagues, so this should be pretty interesting. Uh, number two, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the very for the very first time to the Wrestle Talk podcast. A man that I happen to be a very huge fan of, none other none other than South Broadway slash MMWA slash NWLKC slash NWO St. Louis slash a million other hats that this man wears, and he's very talented at all of them. Ladies and gentlemen, the one, the only, Ben Simon. Well, Rene, it's awesome to be on the show. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> finally, finally, I come to the Wrestle Talk podcast. I can't wait for this round table. Finally, Ben Simon. <laughs> Dude, and, and I will t I will make this promise to you right now, sir. Uh, I know we're going to get into this, and it's going to be a lot of fun, but here in the near future, man, we need to do just a, a Ben Simon-only interview because I got a lot of questions for you. I run into you all the times. I mean, from glory to – I mean, and we're all you're all over the place, man, so we'll definitely coordinate that sometime after this show. And, of course, last but not least, ladies and gentlemen, a man that you can find on a weekly basis – on TV in the St. Louis and Southern Illinois area. That's right, ladies and gentlemen, the voice, the announcer of SICW, Drew Abenhaus. What's going on, gentlemen? It is an honor and my pro my pleasure to be here. And uh, just listening to your opening segment, Renee, I can tell you we're probably going to get along just fine because I agree with pretty much everything that you said there. So it should be a good chat here today. Pleasure to be here. Hey, I appreciate it, Drew. The check is in the mail, brother. I promise. <laughs> nice. Nice. All right, guys. So here's what we're here to do, okay? Um, Self-admittedly, I'm still a babe when it comes to professional wrestling. I'm not going to bore you with, with my story. People want to hear more about you guys. So let's go ahead and start in the same order that I introduced you guys. Luke Roberts, for those people that don't know, I know you've been in the business for a long time, man. Give us a little bit of your backstory on how you got involved with wrestling and how you met these guys. Well, man, a lot of people... We consider me the old guy here in this round table. I mean, again, I first had my experience with pro wrestling when I was 10 years old, of all places, at the South Broadway Athletic Club, watching professional wrestling and watching some of the professional wrestlers that came through the doors of the South Broadway Athletic Club. And over the course of time, my older brother had a professional wrestling, and it kind of just kind of rolled from there. Uh, 30 years old, 30 years of professional wrestling. 
pretty much you name that I've been there in some form or another. I'm actually kind of ironic with having the opportunity to meet both of these gentlemen. Uh, I want to say about four years ago, my program, much very similar to this, called Ringsiders, which Mr. Simon and Mr. Avenhouse were both regular hosts of. And since that point in time, I mean, again, these gentlemen have really taken the reins and have kind of become very good friends of mine over the course of the last few years. But like I said, professional wrestling basically has been my life. And like I said, I wouldn't trade it for anything in the world. It's the greatest, the greatest professional sport, in my opinion, in the entire world. Well, no, no doubt about it. Uh, ben, same question to you, man. I know we all have different backgrounds and come from different places, man. How did you end up in this crazy world of professional wrestling, brother? Well, I actually answered an open door tryout for wrestlers uh, back in 2010. Uh, there was a, a, a podcast, uh, kind of like this one, but not as good. And uh, <laughs> stop it! They said, hey, we're having a uh, an open. I'm not kidding about either, but uh, we're uh, having a, an open door tryout uh, at East Crown Elect Community Center for SICW. And I went, and they they really didn't need a ring announcer, um, but I, I suit and tied it up. Uh, you know, faked it till I made it, so to speak. And uh, Keith Smith, who was the commissioner of the promotion at that time, kind of looked at me like, what the hell is this guy doing here? Um, and uh, Herb Simmons asked me back two days later to ring announce my first show for SICW back then. And uh, from there, I went to South Broadway because they were sister promotions. And, um, you know, it, after that, after you get your foot in the door one place, it's all about networking. And, uh, you know, getting business cards made and, and just talking to different promoters. I worked with Lenny Mephisto shortly after that. He was very controversial back then, more, much more so than he is now. And uh, But it was another promoter to work for. I got my name out there. And um, and then after you get a certain number of promoters, you got to start working your way up. The funny thing about the ring announcer is, unlike the wrestlers or even the referee, there's really only room for one ring announcer every card. So it's tougher to get involved. Um, and, and Luke and Drew, you guys know we, we have to protect our turf. <laughs> because the, some other guy will just come in and, and uh, come pick up the pieces if we miss a date. Um, but that, that's how you get in, man. You, you just got to network and, and be aggressive about it. And, um, and also know your stuff, you know, because if you don't have talent, they're not going to keep you around. And that's why we've been around a while. Dude, that, that's fantastic, and you definitely have a talent for what you do. As I stated before, man, I've seen you all over the place, and, and you're definitely a recognizable guy, and you've done a good job of protecting your turf so far. It sounds like it continues to grow, because just this past weekend, I saw you here in Kansas City working for NWL, so that's definitely something that I enjoy seeing you coming uh, to, to, to my town and doing, doing your thing and plying your trade. All right, Drew, it's your turn, buddy. What's going on? Oh, man. Yes, sir. Uh, basically, I've been a wrestling fan, a wrestling guy ever since I've been a conscious being. Uh, since I've been alive, this has been the one thing that I've sort of had a predilection for. You know, some people are carpenters. Uh, some people are, have different skills. But I'm not very skilled at many things. But I have always known my wrestling. Even a little four-year-old kid, I would be creating mini tournaments and booking in my head with action figures and whatnot. But flash forward to when I was about 20, there was a company named Gateway Championship Wrestling that was uh, in St. Louis doing very well. I started there. I didn't know what my role was going to be. I was a ticket taker at the door. I sold merchandise. I did security, which is silly because I'm not a big guy. I tried to be a wrestler once upon a time. I trained <laughs> for two or three months, quickly learned uh, I am much better at adding something besides my body to the wrestling business. I was never a great athlete, so that wasn't meant to be. But anyway, you stick around long enough and you end up somewhere, right? So about five, six years ago, uh, good old Ben Simon and a buddy of ours named Michael Gordon, Mikey G, who's got a promotion in San Diego nowadays and ran some shows here in St. Louis once upon a time. They were doing a podcast that I weaseled my way into. Uh, it was about wrestling and MMA, and it, I thought it was very good, and I wanted to be a part of it. So I sort of just sort of snuck in like the third man. And it was due to our work with that podcast. As you, you know, uh, you get to know lots of promoters. You get to interview lots of guests, and you, you get to know a lot of people. So it was through that that uh, Herb Simmons actually offered the invitation to join the SICW uh, team, gave me the jersey, 
started out as a ring announcer, and then um, I did good enough at that that they didn't throw me away. Uh, Larry Matisic had a stroke in November of, I'm not good with dates, I think this was 2015, maybe 14. Ben might know that better. But when Larry I'm not stepped sure. out, I... Yeah, I, uh, I I stepped stepped into his role in the television show, and it just uh, one thing leads to another in wrestling. You know, take one step and it leads to the next step. So who knows what we'll be doing six months or a year from now? Just listening to you, Renee, I'm sure that what the over and under it is uh, about probably three to five years. I'm sure you're going to be a promoter yourself. So it's just uh, <laughs> each door leads to a new door. You know. Yeah, you know what? Uh, I, I've heard that, and I've heard that comment once or twice before. Uh, honestly, uh, as you heard me comment uh, in in our high spot segment, um, if I ever decided to go down that road, I know I'd have all the people in the world supporting me, man. Um, but I wouldn't take a step in that direction unless I knew I had the capital to take care of every single person that walks into that building as a worker, as a an announcer, as you know, even the janitor. If you're not prepared. Um, if you're not prepared to take care of the boys, then you're in the wrong business. You're, you're just you just shouldn't even you well, shouldn't even been, start. There's been once or twice, you know. It, it's you're you're really playing your cards. You know, it's very risky. You don't know what the wrestlers are going to do when they don't get their pay. I've seen a guy get cornered into a room and not let out until he had an answer as to how the boys were going to get paid. And I know. I think it was you mentioned that uh, there's been more than once where. Uh, a wrestler has grabbed a promoter by the arm, taken him to his car, driven to an ATM, and have somebody take out their personal yep. money. You're so going to pay me, your, bro. You're, <laughs> you're going to pay me you're one way or another. Your, your health. <laughs> you bet. So, anyway, it's, it, it, it's been good. And just real quick to add to what, what you were saying earlier. Those types of promoters and people, they weed themselves out of the business. Wrestling identifies those people and gets rid of them quickly. But on the flip side, what you were mentioning is it leaves a bad taste and you don't know what, what fans that would have become fans are now not going to or won't come to the next thing because of that. Sorry to jump back 20 minutes. <laughs> no, no, no. It's all good. I mean, and it is it is definitely a... Uh... It is definitely a relevant topic, and and you you guys know it better than anybody because you guys have the distinct privilege of spending time backstage with the guys. In essence, you are one of the guys, with the exception of the fact that you don't actually uh, you know don't actually step in the ring and, and fight. And by the way, I have to kind of go off topic here and say this: uh, ECW original legend Angel Medina is watching us right now, and he says that all three of you better look out because if he gets if if he has it he, his way, he's going to be all over your guys' turf. So be on the lookout because <laughs> Angel Medina. Well, that's actually <laughs> tremendous. I'm a big fan of Angel from back in the day, and that's definitely a message to the SICW locker room. People better uh, watch themselves. Angel's <laughs> not a man to mess with, let me tell you. He he is not. You know, he's, he's, a, he's a badass dude, and he's got that Latino temperament. So that's one thing we definitely don't uh, we don't want to uh, get him riled up. That That's for sure. Um, so... Uh, yeah, go ahead, Drew. No, I, all you. I'm oh. pretty much done. All right, all right cool. So let, let me throw it back here to uh, to Luke. Luke, you were a guy that early in your career experimented with actually being an in-ring performer. Uh, I'm curious to know, man. You did that. Now you do what you do now. H- how does that differ as far as preparation, how you look at an event, how you promote an event? How does your mindset change from being an in-ring performer as a wrestler versus being an in-ring performer as an announcer? Well, Renee, I mean, I, I gotta tell you right now, then I'm really, I'm all down this path a little bit ago. When, you, when you're an in-ring competitor, and I was a person to be in the ring for a number of years before I became to injury, and to me, being an announcer, as far as getting that mental preparedness, it's very similar to being in the professional wrestling ring. The only difference is, is that when you're in the professional wrestling ring, you have to you have to prepare before the event. You gotta warm up your nature if your body is in peak physical condition. Being an announcer to me is a completely different ball of wax, but you have the exact same kind of, of of motivation. I mean, when you sit and look as a professional announcer. You're not going in the ring for 10, 15, 20 minutes and putting your body on the line. Professional announcing is more, it to me, is more of a mental thing. You have to be on top of things all the time. I mean, from the very first, 
What is the very first thing you hear in most professional wrestling men? You hear the announcer. What's the last thing you hear at professional wrestling event? You hear the announcer. Announcers have to be always on their toes. And again, to me, I don't have to get all puffed up. I don't got to get all ready. I don't got to get the adrenaline pumping physically. But you still have to get that adrenaline going because it's one of those things. The transition, if you love wrestling, you're going to do everything you can to be a pro wrestler. One of the things I learned many years ago is you've always got to be ahead of the curve. And that's one of the things to me. When I knew my in-ring career was done, I moved to being an official for a number of years. Then I moved on to being an announcer. It's one of those things, to me, being any part of a professional wrestling event, whether you're the ticket taker, through set, all the way up to the gentleman, the money, the championship, all the promotion. Everybody has that same drive to bring the best each and every time they come out to the ring. No doubt about it. A, a, a great answer, uh, without a shadow of a doubt. Um, I actually want want to ask uh, Ben a very specific question. Um, ben, yes, uh, unlike Drew and um, and Luke, and, and forgive me, you guys can correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, they they stay at home, uh, and what I mean by that is Luke is Dynamo Pro Wrestling through and through, has been for a long time. Drew, I think that's the same case for you in SICW. Um, but yes, sir. You, but you, Ben, you've been able to do something that many others are unable or maybe not even interested in doing, and you've been able to navigate the waters throughout different promotions. And just from an outsider looking in as a media member or fan, whatever you want to classify me as, that's not something that's easy to do. Um, I'll give you... Us, for example, WrestleTalk. Um, a couple of months ago, WrestleMania weekend, we uh, hosted uh, what I called Universe Mania 3, um, sponsored by WrestleTalk at Rockstar Burgers. We were able to coordinate three different promotions to come in and do meet and greets with fans in the same venue at the same time. And when I went into it initially, I was like, there's no way I'm going to get three promoters to agree on the same thing. What you... <laughs> what you... What you've been able to do is navigate the waters well enough to be able to work at multiple promotions. And apparently nobody's catching feelings or getting upset about the fact that, you know, their quote unquote guy is now working for NWL or doing work for KCXW or whatever. (laughs) I'm curious, man. Give us a little bit of insight on how it is that you're able to do that, because I know that's something that's that's not very common in the independent wrestling business on, as a, on a whole. Well, it, it, I like how you said that. And actually, uh, people have gotten upset before, but the, the key is to uh, not react uh, on hot issues. Just let things simmer down and things will be okay. Actually, I think in the state of Missouri, only myself and Brian Thompson really do the uh, the traveling ring announcer thing. And it's just because I want to be around wrestling. I'm following these events anyway, so why not get comped in and ring announce? It's the best deal ever, right? right. Um, so, uh, but the, the, the key in, in all of wrestling is to not have a hot head. Um, it's, I, I think at this point, it's uh, pretty much an open secret now that uh, South Broadway Athletic Club was not happy uh, when NWL STL first started, and uh, they didn't really understand what it was going to be and the leverage that they had, and they gave the locker room an ultimatum at, the, at that point. And once again, this is not a secret that I'm sharing. Uh, this is out there. It is. Um, the thing was... Um, a lot of those guys left at that time. We saw Kevin Lee Davidson and Everett Connors and Jason Roberts leave South Broadway because of that ultimatum. I knew I was leaving at that time. Every championship was vacated. Every championship was vacated, and and that was that was a first. Um, and it, here's the thing: I I knew uh, the, the day before uh, that event on November 12th, I had signed a contract for NWL STL, first ever uh, contract that I signed for such a thing. Um, and I knew that was happening. So uh, whenever they said, who's leaving? I didn't raise my hand because I knew the tensions were really high. Smart man. <laughs> Smart I, man. Yeah. You, I, I, I decided to keep my mouth shut, wait until the next month, 
uh, write Jim and Tony, who were in charge of the promotion there. I wrote them a nice letter, you know, trying to reason with them, and they said, okay, you know, that's cool. And by that time, tension had died down. It's all about, you know, professionalism and, and not and not being too hot with people. And um, the thing is, you can't you can't make all all the dates. Um, when it comes to these promotions, you've got to see what overlaps and what doesn't. And you've got to pick and choose. And you've got to have an invisible hierarchy. You know, if these two promotions that I'm working are running on the same day, who am I going to go with? And then you've got to break the news. And that's not always easy, and you can't tell the promoters where they lie in the hierarchy. Um, but it's, uh, it's always, uh, if, you're, if you're good at your job and you're always reaching out and harassing these promoters to book you, you're going to be okay. Um, so I really like doing the traveling thing. Um, I don't go too far anymore. I think probably Kansas City is about as far as I go now. Um, but uh, I'd be willing to travel further if, uh, if I had more networking. So building up, building out, that's what it's all about. Hey, hey no, no doubt about it. And, and you know, we, we've been blessed here on WrestleTalk to, to make connections now throughout the country with the help of many, many wonderful people. And, and keep an eye out. You know, if you're willing to travel, uh, we're, we're in touch with a lot of different people. So I'll definitely... Uh, Definitely keep that in mind. Uh, now, Drew, kind of piggybacking off the previous question, you, sir, are in almost a completely different boat. You you are working for probably, and, and again, if I'm mistaken, someone correct me, the promotion that has been running longest of any of the promotions in this area, and that's SICW. Uh, I believe close to, if not over 30 years. That's a totally different dynamic because Herb Simmons, just from talking to him once here on the show and a few times off air, seems like a guy that's real big on loyalty and making sure that his guys stay loyal to him. So I'm curious, what is that atmosphere for like, uh, like for you? And can it be somewhat intimidating to know that if you maybe decided to go somewhere else that there could potentially be consequences? That's a great question. And uh, I am kind of the antithesis of Ben. And I, I don't know if this is the only reason, but going back to uh, Ben was the SICW ring announcer. And I believe the main reason that they asked me to step in that slot was exactly what you were saying. They, would, they preferred somebody that would be just an SICW guy that they know could was always going like, to be there no matter what. So uh, that's... You know, and that, that works for me because, I, I, like I was talking about earlier, I've had a few different roles in wrestling, and I still don't know what it will eventually be. But this is just where, this is where I'm at now. When it comes to the ring announcing, um, they approached me to do – I'm not trying to brag or kiss my own ass here. Or pardon the language of that. Hey, put yourself over, bro. It's all good. <laughs> we, I don't mind. I do it all the time. Don't worry about it. <laughs> Fair enough. But um, – so it's a ring announcing gig. It, it's not something I was necessarily looking for, but it's something that was, was given to me and that I'm, I'm very grateful for. It. Don't get me wrong, but going out to find another promotion, it's just not something that I'm, I'm interested in because it's just, uh, I just, uh, I just, yeah, I'm not interested. SICW has always been very good to me. I know, um, you know, we, we try to foster a sort of a family environment with the fans and the wrestlers and everybody. And, I don't know what's that. It's uh, SICW for me. It's turned into something more than just a place to ring announce. And and plus, I'm very old school oriented when it comes to wrestling. Uh, like you, you were talking about LeVar Bell earlier and all that stuff. That the dude. reason I'm able to still love wrestling nowadays, uh, 30 something years into my love of wrestling, is you have to learn to ignore the stuff that you know you're not going to like. That's a big part of being a long-term wrestling fan. You have to learn to not pay attention to the things that you know are going to make you mad or just aren't you're not into. Um, so as you were talking earlier with the, the promotion, uh, was it in Virginia? Anyway, there's a lot of promotions of various credibility and credentials, and it's just working for people like Larry, who's been in, or Larry Matisic and Herb Simmons, who've been doing this for, you know, 40 years plus on both of their ends. It's just, uh, I don't know, it's, it's, I like the professionalism, the talent backstage is very professional, because they know they can't get anything over on the promoters, uh, so it's just, uh, from, from top down, it's just a top-notch top-notch organization and i was a big fan of all indie wrestling companies once upon a time and you just you see enough things over time that make you not a fan of everything 
So I just I don't think I would be interested in putting my name out there just for for anyone, you know. So that's fair. Yeah, that answer your question. Yeah, I absolutely. Absolutely. You got to protect your brand. I understand it. You got to be tactful if you're going to work other places. And actually, um, you brought something up that's pretty interesting. And so I'll kind of start off uh, back at the beginning with uh, with Luke Roberts. Luke, uh, Drew brought up Larry Matisic. And uh, there was quite a bit of noise uh, going into Money in the Bank about them bringing St. Louis wrestling legends uh, that there's no doubt in my mind that Larry Matisic very well falls into that category. And at the last minute, they decided, due to his health, though Herb Simmons came on the show and said, hey, Larry's fine. He could sit ringside at a wrestling show. Don't ask him to go in there and take a bump or anything. But but if he's just going to be sitting there, he's going to be more than okay. And I think everyone on a whole, not only just the St. Louis population, but even um, myself here in Kansas City and others that listen to the Wrestle Talk podcast – were pretty pissed off, you know, that he was left off of that really for what I would consider to be an illegitimate excuse. So I guess I'm going to go around asking you guys the same question. Luke, how did you kind of feel about that, and did you see it as disrespectful as I did? Well, you know, one thing that I really find very fortunate is the WWE has made the attempt on two separate occasions. Back, I believe it was at Bad Blood back years and years ago with the debut of Kane and the first Hell in a Cell matchup, and most recently at Money in the Bank, to acknowledge some of the legends of St. Louis wrestling on two occasions. The first time, I felt very fortunate in the idea that at the time period they acknowledged the legendary uh, Sam Muchnick, a man who's very well-known, kind of one of the, the, the leading figures, if not the leading figure, in the St. Louis wrestling scene and the National Wrestling Alliance for many years. But to me, when you go and you look at Money in the Bank, you look at it being 20 years later, to me, I almost felt that you're going to acknowledge the wrestlers. I feel very much that Larry Matisic should have been put in that same general group of guys. I mean, he has a very select few people who made a monstrous impact in professional wrestling. And I'm not trying to step on any wrestler's toes because, I mean, if you look at the days of the wrestling at the Chase era, some of the best wrestlers in this world came through St. Louis. But one of the men that was the voice, the, was the soundtrack for professional wrestling in St. Louis was Larry Matisic. And I'll be honest with you, when I initially heard that Larry was going to be a part of the event, I was very excited because I felt that he deserved that acknowledgement for all he has done for professional wrestling here in the St. Louis area and throughout this country and throughout this world. Do I think it was handled not in the best of manners? Yeah, I, I totally agree. To me, if you're going to talk about St. Louis, if you're going to talk about the history of St. Louis wrestling, to me, you talk about St. Louis, but if you're talking about people who never competed but deserve the utmost in respect when it comes to St. Louis wrestling, you've got to look at Larry Matisic. And like I said, to me, I think it was a a huge slight not to acknowledge him in the last couple weeks. All right, and Ben, same question to you. Uh, well, I was very fortunate when I first started. Uh, Larry Matizic was uh, the matchmaker at SICW, and I was like, holy cow, 22 years old, I get to work with Larry freaking Matizic. <laughs> and exactly. I knew my wrestling history, like Drew did. And, and, and you know, uh, Larry was... Um, Larry was still was even more active than he is uh, now. It was before the stroke. Um, what a legend! What a mind! Uh, and he absolutely should have been at Money in the Bank, and and uh, m- much more so than Greg Gagne and and Larry the Axe. I mean, like they're great, but they're not really a St. Louis legend. Larry Matizic. I had a conversation with several wrestlers that day, very prominent St. Louis wrestlers. While I'll leave nameless, but rest assured, on the independent scene, they are St. Louis wrestling. And they uh, and I said, how about Gordon Soli? How about Lance Russell? They didn't know the names. How about Larry Matizic? Hmm. They didn't know the name. I, I I was like, holy cow! And I, I started like kind of flipping out. I was like, how how how? That's the only question. How? Um, and it, it's it's a uh, a lot of them were like, oh, Larry Matizic, that that guy in in the wheelchair, right? Like no one knows, no one knows. About <laughs> it's a damn the, shame. It was history. There was. It was it was yeah. freaking laughable, and I, I said, oh my goodness! I was like, how? Uh, 
and, and what a lot of people see on Facebook, you know, a lot of people have a beef with Herb Simmons. I don't. Some guys do, and they associate Larry with that promotion. Larry Matizik, rest assured, is his own man. And while it seems like Herb Simmons might be speaking for him at times, Larry Matizik is one of the best minds in professional wrestling. And if he still had his damn body about him and could be more mobile, I think more people would know that. And I think it's a shame people don't realize. He'll tell you himself, he laughs about it, he says, this man is older than me. He's really not that old, and his mind is still there, and he's a freaking genius. Well, I'm going to jump in here real quick, and Ben, you hit the nail right on the head with me. When I was younger, when I first started watching professional wrestling, and it might show my age, watching it back in the late 70s and early 80s, I grew up, it was, it was like when you were talking about Georgia Championship Wrestling, you would associate it with the legendary Gordon Soley, the scene of, of announcers. But when you look at St. Louis, for years upon years, who was the staple? Who was the key person that you would see behind that microphone? It was either Mickey Garagiola or Larry Madison. And this man, like I said, gave the soundtrack to so many key moments in St. Louis professional wrestling history. And again, it's one of those things, if you know something about professional wrestling, St. Louis has such a history with professional wrestling. And Larry Matisic's name definitely doesn't need to be left out of that. Agree. Drew, your thoughts? Man, I don't know that I can say anything any better than these two guys just did. Uh, of course, I'm going to be partial. I'm directly under his learning tree. I can testify to what Ben says. Uh, Larry's mind is as sharp as it is today as it was when he was probably in his 20s. I mean, you talk to Larry about uh, St. Louis wrestling history. He recalls specific dates he remembers exact finishes his mind is still there and like ben said if it wasn't for just the fact that his back really has uh fallen to crap he has spinal stenosis which essentially it, uh, no joke brother I'm no joke make myself yeah so it basically his back is is real jacked up and he's been in the wheelchair now for i'm not sure a, a handful of years but his mind is as sharp and as young as it ever was and it's a shame to see that. And here's the thing that sucks and that I think is silly. WWE, when it's convenient for them, hypes up, uh, be a star. No bullying. John Cena goes and does make wishes. We love disabilities, et cetera, et cetera. You're telling me that a dude in a motorized wheelchair, like that's the deal breaker, a motorized wheelchair, he can't get down in the front row with the rest of them dudes? Garbage. So, I don't know. It just seems silly to me. And. I don't know. They're, I, I they're really hope, forced, they're I fortunate really hope that that stuff on. doesn't... Yeah, who knows? It's, it's fortunate that this stuff doesn't really get public because, I mean, it's the antithesis of what they're supposed to be about, right? But anyway, yeah. it is what it is. It's unfortunate, but uh, Larry's, you know... It's, I'm sure it hurt his feelings a little bit, but Larry's busy. Larry books uh, every all of our cards for SICW, so there's no time to rest or feel sorry for oneself. He's got... Uh, plenty to do and he's still contributing to the St. Louis wrestling scene as actively today as he did once upon a time so that's the that's the plus side in all of this even though it's sad he didn't get to go and see some of his friends and uh, be around people that would have enjoyed seeing him he, he's, he's moving on okay. I know that about Gentlemen, I'm, I'm sorry I've got to interrupt here I, I've got to get back to my job here but uh, thank you so much for having me on I really appreciate it you got it, Ben. Hey, and we'll set something up here in the near future, man. Thanks for joining us today. All right. Have a good one. Take it easy, brother. Peace. All right, peace. I love Ben, man. He's a busy guy. All right, so let's uh, let's let's circle the wagons here because I have one last question before we get into shooting shot, and hopefully you will appease us, Drew and Luke, and, and hang out with us because that, that always tends to be a little bit of a fun segment. Uh, so here's the last question, and and, and it it may be a bit con controversial, but that's what we do here on the Wrestle Talk podcast, man. We like to talk about what the Wrestle Talk family wants to hear about. That's right. <laughs> not not often I, I laugh make, make or sure you don't, just make sure you don't say that too many times, Drew. Don't make sure you say that too many times. Right? What's well, so he could just he's just gonna appear <laughs> if you say it three times, he appears. <laughs> Oh, uh, wouldn't that be something? Say it three times in the mirror, poof, there's a Bischoff. Again. There's a Bischoff right there, and fall, right behind him is Russo. <laughs> right behind him is Russo taking credit. Yikes. <laughs> oh, goodness. Uh, <laughs> Tremendous. So, so here, here's the question. Um, because of some of the recent happenings uh, in St. Louis wrestling within the last couple of months, um, 
I think it's there's been like kind of an undercurrent that hasn't really been talked about. But because of what happened here recently with, with a, a well-known promotion um, folding, at least apparently folding here in the last couple of weeks, uh, the controversy began, or I should say the conversation kind of was ignited as to what is it about the St. Louis wrestling scene that A, makes it successful and B, makes it so hard to break into? So my question is this. Ooh. What is it about the St. Louis, Louis wrestling scene that makes it special? And is there a part of it that is inclusive that says, if you're not from here, don't come here. We support our own. Or do you guys believe that it's more of an isolated situation? And I think we all know exactly what I'm talking about here. Okay. What is it? Is there something in the water in St. Louis that says, if you're not from here, don't come here? Or is it more of one of those situations where maybe the cards weren't played properly and that's why there wasn't the success that everybody anticipated? Well, Renee, I'm, I'm, I'm going to jump in here. To me, like I said, I've been around professional wrestling in St. Louis for 30 years. I've been one, when I was younger, I was like a Ben Simon that would have no problem jumping in a car and traveling and going to places like Cape Girardeau, like Chicago, like Kansas City. Uh, I had an opportunity to go down to uh, Paducah, Kentucky. Been to a lot of different places in my career. And St. Louis is always going to have a special place. And it's going to have that special place because of the lineage and the tradition of St. Louis wrestling. And I go back to a quote from uh, two-time WWE Hall of Famer, among hundreds of other accolades, Ric Flair. If you wrestled in St. Louis for Sam Muchnick, you had made it somewhere in the world of professional wrestling. And I'll tell you right now, professional wrestling is not an exclusive club. Professional wrestling in St. Louis, to me, is the opportunity to have promotions bring the best professional wrestling possible into the squared circle. And I'll tell you right now, when it comes to professional wrestling, the inside the ring, there are so many different components in professional wrestling. You have the wrestlers, you have the referees, you have the announcers, you have security, you have the ticket takers, you have the people breaking down the rings and setting up the rings and setting up the chairs and doing all the promotion. There are so many different pieces. The fact is, to me, professional wrestling is not an exclusive club. It, you get what you put into it. It's like any other business. The idea of where professional wrestling, you have to be able to put yourself out there on the line each and every night and do what you're supposed to do. And I know exactly what you're talking about. I mean, again, that's one of the things that I feel very fortunate when, when I accepted this offer to come here on the round table tonight. It's because of the fact that the people who are out there, and like I said, you look at the Drew Abenhouses, you look at the Ben Simons, you look at our, our broadcast colleague, Chris Rodell. I mean, again, among others, people who have gone out there and have not spent just a few months, people who spent years under different learning trees, learning from some of the greatest to ever step in a ring or step behind a microphone. You know, to me, professional wrestling is what you put into it. And I'll tell you right now, when it comes down to St. Louis, what you give is what you're going to get from it. And to me, St. Louis is always going to be one of those places. I've, I've talked to a lot of people who've been here on the Rumble Talk podcast who've done interviews all over the place. And they say to wrestle in St. Louis is one of those places you have to come to because the scene, the fans are always energized, they're already always ready to go, but one thing is constant. They want the best in-ring action, and that's what it is. You have to bring it each and every time. All right, and, and of course, Drew, I gotta get your input here, because I know you've got some strong thoughts, yeah. man, so, so let us have it. <laughs> the, I'll try to keep them less strong here so they're easily digestible. <laughs> but uh, you cut me off if I start the rambling. No, uh, but Luke was right. 
St. Louis has always been the epicenter. If you go back to wrestling at the Chase, St. Louis was not a territory. This was not a territory. Uh, when it was time for TV tapings and the big shows at the Teal Center, they would pick from the best in the country. It wasn't just the St. Louis talent. So it was whoever was the hottest thing going on at the time. Uh, anywhere, from anywhere, from New York, from Florida, from Texas, it didn't matter. Uh, you didn't have to stay here because it wasn't a full-time territory. So St. Louis fans were always used to the premier talent. So I will say that it's, it's possible that because of that, St. Louis fans may be a little picky. But we've got six or seven other independent companies in the St. Louis area that do good enough to keep going and they all present something a little bit different. So I, I feel like if you show up and you, you give people something that they're willing to pay for, they'll pay for it. It's just that NWL in St. Louis, it wasn't one specific thing. It was a bunch of different things that all combined that just made that too big of an uphill battle. The location might have had something to do with it, but Casa Loma Ballroom is in an okay spot. It was rough. Mm, some years ago, but in the last five years, that area has turned into more of a, almost like a hipster spot. With it a is. couple of music joints and some new restaurants opening up, so it's not as dangerous as people that don't come around there maybe think that it might be. It's not what it used to be, so I don't, I don't think the location was a big deal. The dates, of course, weren't on Thursdays and Sundays. It's never great. People got stuff to do, you know? People yeah. are family people, and especially in the summertime, uh, it's Fridays and Saturdays are always going to be preferable. That hurt. But the number one thing, I think, is just that the St. Louis area is saturated with wrestling. In Kansas City, great wrestling. they came in and they took, yes, they, they took the spot of Metro Pro, who was the, what was the premier uh, company, from what I understand. I know there's, um, is it KCX? KCXW uh, and G G G GWF and uh, one smaller Lucha promotion. So, yeah, there wasn't a whole bunch to compete with, that's for sure. Okay. You know, he slid in, and you have Chris Goff, who's a, just a really smart guy, who was there to sort of steer the ship there in Kansas City. But here in St. Louis, there's if you're a wrestling fan in St. Louis, I think you already found your, your promotion, your thing. And you were either looking for existing fans, which I don't think we're that fond of it, or you're looking for new fans, which for whatever reason didn't really flock over. But it's just, it's just, it's just, uh, they were right in the middle of a bunch of coincidences that just, that's how it was. And, and to be honest, the company that they assimilated, St. Louis Anarchy, was sort of a counterculture sort of a fan base anyway. So just, if you're a St. Louis Anarchy fan, and then you see a millionaire coming in, and they're moving their shows, and they're buying out and renaming your company, and you're, they're changing the names of your favorite wrestlers. That was a big one. I think that even amongst these, yeah, I think even amongst Anarchy fans who may have followed them, I think that almost uh, turned them, it, it, it rubbed them the wrong way. You're going to burn those fans, because it's, the Anarchy was sort of, like I said, it's a counterculture. It was in a small, but really unique and really cool night at Columbus Hall, that had a really loud, cool fan base. And what they did, really, STL, uh, NWL STL coming in and taking St. Louis Anarchy out of their building in that spot, what that did is it created a void that Michael Elgin and Glory Pro is really the true benefit of this whole thing because I feel like they've come in and he's set up something here in St. Louis that I feel like is probably what NWL wanted to do. But Michael Elgin has come in and really been knocking it out of the park with Glory Pro. So there's there's pros and cons to everything. But no, they're moving to St. Peter's, so they have a chance to uh, do a new start, a fresh start with hopefully uh, some a fresh audience. And we'll see how sort of uh, NWL FDL version 2.0 goes. I wish them luck. I mean, it's, it's cool. That's out in Harley's neck of the woods, so that'll be tough. But. Yeah, no. So it goes. That's the real business, right? It's fun, fun to watch. No, no doubt. Yeah. Well, the, the controversy, sur the controversy surrounding it is what really excites me because I mean, you know, at least they were savvy enough to admit that it just wasn't working. I think they've got a ton of intelligent people over there. I mean, when you talk about uh, Matt Jackson. Uh, and, and the group of guys that he's working with. It's just one of those situations where you basically stole their baby. You, you stole what, what I would call to be mm. their ECW, 
And then you said, hey, don't worry. We took your ECW away, but guess what? We're going to give you WWE. And that's so much better because it's flashier and prettier and cooler. And everyone was like, no, we don't like flashy. We, we don't like better. We like what we like. We like it that it's hot. We like it that it's hot. We like it that it's crowded. We like it that we can get pizza during the show. You know, like they – and I, I, Drew, I, 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 can, I almost verbatim want to repeat what you said because I think – you took their baby away from them, and of course there was going to be backlash. And like you said, the the biggest beneficiary of this is is Glory Pro and the other promotions around the area. I can't imagine the SICW and that Dynamo Pro and the the other uh, successful promotions in that area uh, aren't going to reap the benefit of it because the fans are going, hey, you know what? That wasn't for me, but I know there's something else around here that's been here for a while that I can I can really sink my teeth into. So that I guess at the end of the day, it ends up working out for everybody, and I don't think NWO's hurting all that much because, well, you know, they've got the resources to not have to really worry about it and just move on to something else. So you're some kind of... <laughs> I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, that's a great point. Yeah, no, no doubt. So, you know, I'm going to piggyback off here for a second. I've got a large harbor and I'm going to have two challenge things coming up in the next few minutes. Um, I'm going to tell you right now, Drew made a comment earlier on, and to me, you know what? Competition creates catch. Competition is one of those things where you may have all these different things, you may have all these visions, and again, I'm not saying it towards one company. Each professional wrestling company in this area has their own certain niche of wrestling fans. Yeah. And when you sit down and look at it, it's all, and it was said earlier on, I, I hope I can kind of wrap this all together, what you were saying earlier in High Spot. It's about the reputation, the bringing in night in, night out, bringing what your professional wrestling fan wants. I mean, again, I know seeing a lot of the professionals, like Dynamo Pro, for example, you're going to see a little bit of everything. You're going to see the high flyers. You're going to see the brawlers. You're going to see the technical wrestlers. Same thing with your SICWs, your MMWA, and for some people, that's their their ball, their ball, their cup of tea. There are others that like that kind of edgier kind of feel of things. But the fact remains this: I think the biggest, as, as you guys were saying here, the biggest winner of everything right now has been the fans that support promotions like Dynamo Pro, like SICW, yeah. like MMWA that go out there. And say, you know what? I know the reputation. I know what the wrestlers in these promotions are bringing each and every night. And I gotta say that it's. It, I gotta say thank you to the fans who make professional wrestling just as much as the wrestlers and all the staff. It's the fans oh. that make professional wrestling in St. Louis <laughs> such a big deal. Yes, sir. If the fans didn't show up, we'd all be getting together and putting on shows to empty buildings. So none of this would matter. So no fans, no wrestling. God bless the St. Louis fans, Kansas City fans, all wrestling fans. No matter what style you like, because there's a lot of arguing on the internet nowadays. True. This is the way to do it. This is the way to do it. But, you know, just no matter what you love, we all love pro wrestling, right? So let's try to focus on that. Ignore what you don't like. Love what you like. It's I don't know. Absolutely. I think if a lot if a lot more people took that, that angle or that perspective on things, they would enjoy uh, wrestling a lot more instead of always trying to pick it apart. Because if you love it, then you don't nitpick the small stuff. You enjoy it overall. Well, with, with that said, guys, we have run a little bit over, but it's quite all right. Don't worry about it. I think it's going to be totally worth it because now it's time. The pleasantries are over. It's time to get a little bit of frustration off of our chest. So, ladies and gentlemen... As we do every single week here on the Wrestle Talk podcast, we're going to get into the shoot and shout segment where you got a little bit of time to get a whole lot off your chest. Intern Timmy, you already know what I'm looking for, baby. Hit that music. It's just one of those days where you don't want to wake up. Everything is everybody sucks. You don't really know why, but you want to jump the fire. If someone said, oh, you know, you need contact. And if you wish, you wish. All right, Joe, take the lead, buddy. 
Oh, my goodness. Oh, I said, this is the shooting show. Hey, man, when you get to talk about what some of that you want, whatever is on your mind, whether it's wrestling, whether it's, it, it could be anything you want, so I'll go ahead and start it off. You all can probably figure out what my shooting shout is. My shooting shout is Katie Wrestling Promoters. If you're going to put on a wrestling show, make sure that you do exactly what you say you're going to do. I understand that you have people that are going to cancel and whatnot, but if you have a wrestling show and you're advertising 30 big names, people know that that's probably not going to happen, and it's just... It looks bad on the wrestling community and, and everything else. And if you're going to be a shady wrestling promoter, then get out of the wrestling business. Plain and simple. Boom. Luke Roberts, what do you got for us tonight, man? Well, well actually, I got to tell you right this. I got a shoot and a shout, and I'm going to go ahead and kind of have a first here. I want to go ahead and give a shout out to a man who I feel was the MVP last week. And if anybody was following on Facebook, got to give Joe Lance the MVP for last week, man. Absolutely. I mean, again, he was he was he was taking care of business. I mean, again, it's just like in professional wrestling. He was playing hurt, and he went through just like a trooper. My shout, my my shoot this week is very simple. In this day and age, we're 2017. Everybody talks about having your Facebooks and your Twitters and your Periscopes and all that kind of stuff and having things like, and I'm going to show my age, your emails. The fact is, ladies and gentlemen, it's 2017. If you make a commitment to talk to somebody and you say, I'm going to get a hold of somebody, please step through with it. I had a lot of people that I've had to deal with over the course of the past few months that have said, oh, I'll get a hold of you here or I'll get a hold of you here. And they don't come through. If they All come right. through, they come through three weeks <coughs> later. So when it comes down to nope. it, if Hold you're going to make I'm a point to talk. It's round table. Who's talking? <laughs> Call people out. Don't be big. Who are you talking about? Uh, I, I, I'll tell you right now. Shoot, brother. I'm shoot, not, shoot. <laughs> well, I, like I said, it's one of those. I'm not, I'm not at, out of respect to those that are choosing to do that because they do have a little more mm-hmm. say to me. But I'm going to tell you right now, right here. It's simple. If you make a commitment, if you say you're going to do something, do it. Drew, I know you're going to jump right off of what I got to say, so I'm going to throw things to you, sir. I don't know. I want to know what you're talking about specifically. I know what he's talking about. Hey, hey, hold on. Let me just say this, Drew. There's a certain major promotion that is supposed to be coordinating some things with the Rest of Talk podcast, which, if I remember correctly, they reach out to us, not us to them, and there was a scheduling conflict. So Luke Roberts oh. is is more than ha- more than justified in what he's saying. And we don't want to burn any bridges, but let's just say it's one of the top top five or ten promotions in the world. Let's just leave it at that. Oh. Well, I'm going to I'm gonna tell you this before we go back to Drew. It wasn't just that, but there's a lot of things going on right now. If you make a commitment, you say you're going to get a hold of somebody, do it. Yeah, don't piss off the techno you're kid. trying to sell your house. Luke Roberts is having problems selling his house. <laughs> <laughs> hey, bro. hey, you know what, Drew? I think you're right. All right, Drew, what do you got for us tonight, man? <laughs> so this is my first time. Just uh, clarify me for, for first timers. This is just a uh, rant about what's bothering you, or just dude, whatever you want. It doesn't even have to be wrestling related, dude. Anything that's chapping your ass, man, let it out, brother. All right, uh, I'll do a wrestling one and a life one. First of all, wrestling. This goes from WWE to the top down. I feel like a one reason a lot of these mid to upper card WWE guys aren't perceived as upper card main event guys is because they're all work wearing like Kmart looking gear, man. <laughs> Roman Reigns has been wearing the same crap since he's moved up. He's got a decent build. Get some freaking tight, right? Kevin Owens. I understand he's probably self conscious, but get a singlet. Big dudes used to wear a singlet. Uh, Dean Ambrose, when is it okay to wrestle in jeans and a dirty tank top? Like, come on. <laughs> if you're supposed to be perceived as a main event wrestler, can we put these dudes in some gear to make them look like wrestlers? Go back just a couple of months ago, Brock Lesnar and Goldberg. Goldberg is like 50. He still came out in some tights, and he he's, he's perceived as a main event dude. So that's something that's been biting my chaps for, for a good while. Uh, about wrestling, just for Christ's sake. It's easier than ever before. Go to highspots.com. Uh, if you're a WWE, have your nice seamstress lady make you some gear that make you look like a wrestler. It can be awkward at first, 
when Chris Jericho, when Triple H, when they were both making that transition from mid-card to upper-card guys, they switched from pants to tights. It feels weird at first, but it makes you look like a freaking professional wrestler. So can more professional wrestlers get some gear that makes them look like professional wrestlers, please? That's my, that's been my nemesis for years now. I hate it. Especially if you got a decent body, not to sound that way. But if, uh, you know, if Roman Reigns has got a decent build, why are you wearing, he's got like D-Lo Brown gear from 99. So <laughs> that dead team. vest. <laughs> You're in main events now, let's, let's stop it. And uh, I don't know, not to sound too hippie-ish, but just in real life, man, it's just uh, let's all just be nice to each other. You know how easy it is to smile to a stranger and shake their hand? Uh, people need to spend less time, not to knock, because I know you're, you're an online-based uh, podcast and stuff, so I'm not knocking the Internet. Let's all spend less time interacting on Facebook and Twitter and yelling at each other, because all the things that people are mad about each other in 2017, when you go out in the real world, and interact with strangers and real people and smile at them. Uh, everybody's cool, man. So, I don't know. That's my point. Let's all just be cool. <laughs> everybody's got differences. Everybody's got reasons to hate the other guy. But that's just what you see when you look at too much TV and you're on Facebook too much. Let's get away from that. Let's all just uh, let's all just be friends. I don't know. Uh, let's all... Especially in the wrestling community. It seems like there's a lot of division even within the wrestling community. It's people that all love the same thing, but they're mad at each other because they don't like the exact same version of the same thing. So let's try to knock that off if we can. If you don't like something, ignore it. If you like something, talk about it and preach it. Otherwise, just go about your business, right? Anyways. Yeah, ha- hashtag, hashtag dive. <laughs> all right, so, so here's, here's mine, and I'm going to keep it short. I wish I could yell this on a megaphone to the whole world. Guys, when you hashtag indie wrestling, it is not I N D Y. That is not the indie. That is like the Indianapolis 500. That's the that's the short for No, it is I N D I E. That is the correct word for indie when you're using it in the context of independent wrestling, okay? Please. I know this is not going to go anywhere. Everyone's just too used to doing it. It is I N D I E indie that kind of indie not indie like Indianapolis not I N D Y it is indie wrestling please stop using the Y instead of the I E you're wrong you're you're slow you need to read a book okay if you can't get there there and there right there's no way you're gonna get this right either so you might as well just go ahead and give up okay but listen it's indie hashtag indie I N D I E indie wrestling you're freaking killing me over here that's my shooting shout for the day my goodness i think i just broke a sweat i think i need a donut tremendous (laughs) all right drew Uh drew and luke unfortunately we've reached the end of our time tonight closing statements please well, I'm going to go ahead because this everything that's been thrown to me first tonight. First of all, again, I want to say thank you to the Wrestle Talk podcast for giving these, these announcers, myself, Drew Evanhouse, spent the time and the opportunity to speak on, on, on a variety of things. also want to thank the fans, not just for the Wrestle Talk podcast, but for all the promotions throughout this world to take the time and go out and see what professional wrestling is. I mean, again, there's a lot of different styles and a lot of different ways to, to see wrestling throughout this great country. And, again, make it a point to go out and support your promotions, your independent promotions, just to kind of keep you at, at, at ease there, Renee. <laughs> uh, <laughs> keep getting out there. Support your independent wrestling. You have the wrestlers who are going out there and laying it all on the line each and every night to do what's there. And, again, Guys, you want to see professional wrestling, make it a point. Go to things like Facebook. Check out Facebook. Check out uh, Twitter. Check out YouTube. Go out and see good, professional, independent wrestling. Because it's one of those things, just like Drew said earlier on, Ben has said earlier on in this segment as well. When you see good, quality, professional wrestling, it's going to take you to a place that you want to be. And I'll tell you right now. I went there when I was young, and now pushing the the older years of my career, for lack of a better word, I'm still loving every minute of it. Drew? 
Boom. I don't know. He's got me all mushy now. Aww. Oh, <laughs> there, right? So, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. It's an honor to talk to uh, a lot of intelligent wrestling folks. Uh, Renee, Joe, it's real cool talking to you. If we ever meet each other, the first round is on me. You got uh, it, man. Check me out. I'm on Twitter. If anybody cares about a guy that just retweets old wrestling pictures and MMA stuff, it's at Drew Abenhaus. That's A-B-B-E-N-H-A-U-S, that last name, at Drew Abenhaus. Easy enough. Check us out. Our next show, SITW, July the 15th. Uh, I don't know if you're supposed to be talking to Curtis Wilde in a bit, but Curtis Wilde will be taking on Moondog Rover. Curtis's wife, Wildfire, is the special referee. Um, there's a brand new, uh, just random wrestling news, I guess, something to talk about. There's a brand new Bruiser Brody DVD that just came out on High Spot. It's three discs. It's a documentary. It's rare matches. It's interviews with uh, all the people that knew him best. We'll have some copies for sale at SICW July 15th, or you can go to highspot.com. It's tremendous. I've seen the documentary. If all, all wrestling fans should check that out. And I think you can stream it from High Spot uh, if you don't want the physical copy. But anyway, check us out on Facebook, SICW Wrestling, or Herb Simmons on Facebook. He drops news better than any of us. So, Or there's a brand new Wrestling at the Chase. And that's not new, but Herb has also gotten in on the Wrestling at the Chase page a group on facebook and he's got a ton of old programs that go back to like the 60s so if you like uh pictures of old programs and old fritz von eric versus edward carpentier old stuff like that check out uh, the wrestling at the chase facebook page as well thank you for letting me rant it's been an honor to be here gentlemen and uh god bless everybody Hey, God bless you. We appreciate it, Drew. I'm done. And definitely holding you to that, man. We'll be at SICW, hopefully before the end of the year, man. Russell Talk Podcast will be invading SICW, hopefully before the end of the year, man. So thank you, and we'll catch you uh, down the road. Sounds good. You guys take care. You got it. We appreciate it. Yep. All right. Yep. There we have it, Joe. I know we had quite a few people on hold and uh, waiting for the FWWC. Why don't you do me a quick favor, man? Let's go ahead and knock out those few callers. We'll get Big Daddy P on here in just a second. And then a few minutes after that, man, the volatile Curtis Wilde of SICW joins us. So, Joe, no break today. Let's get those callers in, and I will be right back with you in just a second. You got it, buddy? All right. All right. Handle that. Here we go. All right, ladies and gentlemen, it is now time for the... uh, Fantasy Wrestling Worldwide Chapter segment on the uh, Wrestling Talk Podcast with Joe and Renee. We got a couple callers. We got a couple callers. Um, our first caller is a new person. First caller. Uh, she has been tearing it up in the women's division. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, La, Mur- La Murta, how are you? I'm doing wonderful. That is good. Now, uh, you have taken the uh, women's division by storm. Uh, um, what are your thoughts about the uh, Fantasy Wrestling Worldwide chapter so far? Well, I mean, of course I'm going to be the hottest thing ever. Nobody ever has ever seen anything like what I've done in the women's division. So it's a fresh slap in the face for them. Well deserved, if absolutely. you may ask. Absolutely, absolutely. Now, you recently had a match with the uh, with the uh, goddess. What are your thoughts about that match? You all went to a draw, I think. I believe that you both went through a table. We did. We ended through a table, um, but the bitch totally deserved it after putting me through the barricade. Let me just say. And, and but it's definitely and then, not over this. This steel cage match that she wants to do at Great Balls of Fire, she's going to have her throat torn out. Wow. Those are some really, really, really strong, strong words. Uh, do you have uh, of your plans to uh, win the uh, uh, women's championship, or are you just here to just cause chaos? A little bit of both, to be honest. The championship isn't the first thing on my list. Once the Enchantress wins, if she wins, she won't keep it for long. If Misty retains it, she'll be next on my list. 
Yes. Well, hey, listen, real quick. I'm back, guys. Sorry, I had to handle something that I, I perceived as an emergency, but everything is fine. La Muerte, I have one question for you. Everyone's been asking, do you presently have an affiliation with La Familia Worldwide? I've gotten that question on multiple occasions because of your name, I think mostly, but will you or and are you willing to clear the air pertaining to that question? I mean, I think a really big solid part of my whole persona is the mystery, and I think I want to keep it that way. <laughs> Absolutely love it. I, I, that's the answer I expected, and I think it's a great one. La Muerte, as a member of the board of directors, if, if Aria, the goddess, isn't competing for the women's championship match at Great Balls of Fire, you have your match. Good to hear. I also have one more thing to address before we go. Please do. This Corbin Slater, who decided to call me out on the Facebook page, he wants to have a little dance on Tuesday night. Well, my response will be coming up later on this evening. Woo! You know what? Corbin Slater stirring the pot, and I'm sure La Muerte is going to have something for him. We appreciate it, and we cannot wait to see you in action for the very first time. Of course. We'll catch you again. Thank you. Joe, she's just as creepy over the phone as she is in her promos. And for those who don't know what we're talking about, the FWWC, World's Greatest Fantasy Wrestling uh, Group, go to WrestleTalkPodcast.com, go over to the FWWC tab, and read all about it. So... With that said, and I know we've got a couple other callers, I just got to go ahead and communicate this information. Number one, a reminder, the Hardcore Championship will be up for competition at SummerSlam. We currently have four of the five people uh, that are going to be in that match, and those men are, here real quickly, Julius Cairo, Big Hoss, Marcus Mayhem, and Michael Reese. There's still one open spot for that. Number two, we do have uh, the continuation of the Lethal Lottery Tag Tournament. Uh, coming up or continuing on Monday, and for those who have not been keeping up, the three teams that have moved on so far are Kronos to tighten the time and Danny Lane. <coughs> Kronos to tighten the time and Danny Lane, which is uh, I believe the Express Way through time. We have the Microphone Mafia has moved on, and also the Battle Tanks have moved on. So if I'm not mistaken, we have the Saint and Marcus Mayhem. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, Marcus Mayhem and Nightmare Jones that are going to be competing up against um, the Marvelous Mechanics, I believe. And then we also have, I'm sorry, I'm having a little bit of a problem seeing the image here. Um, okay, I'm embarrassed. I, I can't figure out what these other two teams are. So, yeah, just check the FWWC and I'll go ahead and post that. I'm, I'm using images and I'm having a hard time making them out right now. So, hey. FWWC, guys, the world's greatest fantasy wrestling group, where people who otherwise would be wrestlers get an opportunity to be characters and compete for championships. It is fantastic. Make sure you guys check it out. All right, Nightmare Jones, hit that music. I mean, tell intern Timmy to hit that music because it's time for Snippets of Truth with Big Daddy P. You know, I've had better days. I've spent yeah, the last 24 yeah. hours with some kind of like stomach bug of some kind. I don't know. Mm -hmm. All I know is, is uh, it has been brutal, but I wouldn't miss this for the world. Big Daddy P, you're the real MVP. That's why we love you, Big Daddy P. Agreed. <laughs> I know you do. Thank you. So, so Renee, uh, you're going to have to read the prayer request for me because I've got my vision is all jacked up, dude. I don't know how, what I got, but, man, me and the bathroom have been real close the last 24 hours. Okay. <laughs> All right. The first one is from our buddy uh, Chris slash Tank Westbrook, and he says, My friend Elizabeth is going to see the doctor tomorrow. Uh, she already went at the beginning of the month, and they found 
that her stress test was abnormal. Uh, the front of her heart isn't getting enough oxygen. She has to have a heart something done um, to see if they can – a heart cath done, I'm sorry, to see uh, if she has a blockage. Uh, so please see if we can keep her in our prayers. Um, also, Big Daddy P, as I work diligently to pull this up, um, the uh, the next one was from our buddy Assad, who is uh, found new employment. He's going to be working at the Amazon warehouse. He's pretty excited about it, but he wants it to go well, so he's requesting par- prayers for that in his new vocation. And then we also had our friend Abby from the St. Louis area, uh, or I should say Gabby, my apologies. Uh, she is Glorious Gabby, Girl Talk WWE on Twitter. She says, my great uncle in Italy is having brain surgery tomorrow, which the brain surgery would have been today. Mm-hmm. Prayers would be appreciated. Those are the prayer requests for today. Big Daddy P, take it away. Father God, there are so many things we can look at and see problems that exist in our life and then you you we hear about these stories of people who are uh, having issues much worse than even what we have experienced and Father you know Elizabeth you know her heart situation Father as he was reading that off I was trying to imagine what she must be thinking well the good news is is I don't know if she knows you, but we know you, and so we petition her on your behalf that uh, you would continue to work with the doctors to help find an answer for her heart situation. Father, you also know the request for Assad and what his needs are. You know what his desires are and his location situation. Just ask that you would open every door that needs to be opened and close every door that needs to be closed. Father, you also heard Gabby's request as well father we know that you are not only faithful but in all that you do you continue to supply for our needs according to the riches of your grace and so we know father that with these prayer requests we know not only have you heard them but you've already begun to answer them i also want to add uh, my body as well father you know that uh, exactly what i'm going through uh, but it's those that uh I serve that uh, right now are paying a very heavy price uh, for me not being available. And uh, that's why I ask for healing uh, more than anything. I just thank you so much that uh, we have this time that we can come to you in prayer for those that are listening right now, Father, who, who don't know you, who don't have eternal life, that they would hear the good news that you set yourself to die as a substitute for them so that they could have fellowship with you even after this time that we're here. Your word tells us that if we believe that you are the Christ, that we would have eternal life. And so for those right now that are listening, Father, who haven't made a choice to you yet, that they would, by faith alone in Christ alone, turn to you so that they could have eternal life. We just thank you so much, Father, and we love you. And we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Big Daddy P, please get well very, very soon. And we look forward to talking to you again next week. Brother, if you need anything in between then, you already know our phone numbers. Give us a call, okay? Consider it done, guys. Thank you. All right. Love Big Daddy P. Love Big Daddy P. And listen, for those of you guys who are like, what the heck was that about? Why? Everybody believes something different, okay? I happen to be a Christian. Joe is as well. But we don't intend to alienate everybody. It's just a part of the show. We wanted to make it a little bit more personal. And for those of you who don't believe, that's cool too. Um, But what's important is that we all acknowledge that Big Daddy P comes in and does something with the greatest intentions. And he genuinely has love and appreciation for everybody that sends in a prayer request. For some people, it's good vibes. For other people, it's prayers. The bottom line is he has a heart for people, and he wants things to be better for them. And the way that he believes is the best way to accomplish that is through prayer, and we respect the hell out of him for that. And that's the bottom line because, well, the night owl said so. 
Nightmare Jones, how you feeling, man? Good show so far, right? I'm doing good. Doing good. All right, perfect. Now, my question is, are you ready for things to get a bit volatile? Are you ready? Oh, absolutely. I'm always... <laughs> well, I know you are. Plus, you love mayhem anyway, Joe, right? <laughs> exactly. Now, I will preface this. Um, this isn't the first time that we've had Curtis Wilde on the show. Uh, last time we managed to keep it cordial. Um, but, you know, Curtis tends to be extremely opinionated. He thinks very highly of himself. And listen, the guy's been in the business for a long, long time, and, and it's hard for me to hold it against him because he's earned that respect. But Curtis Wilde is the kind of guy that isn't going to ask for your respect. He is going to take it. He is going to demand it. And if you refuse, then he's going to put you in a world of hurt. And, and you know what? That part of Curtis Wilde, I truly enjoy because this man is a fighter. Yes, sometimes it's under eh, somewhat questionable circumstances because, I mean, you know, he's getting ready to go into this fight against Moondog Rover, okay, on the 15th. But his partner in crime, his valet, his girl, his lady, his wife happens to be the special guest referee. How Herb Simmons allowed this to happen is beyond me. I'm really not sure, and I don't understand how Herb Simmons could allow something like this, but... It is what it is, and when it, you know, Herb Simmons is a guy you got to respect. He's been doing this for longer than I can remember, and if this is a decision that him and Larry made, then you've got to imagine that it is what is indeed best for business. So, without further ado, let me double check your Nightmare Jones. Is Curtis Wilde ready to go and on the line? He is ready to go. Okay, well, hopefully he's not going to give me a too hard of a time for that introduction because I did my very best last time. He was like, what the hell kind of, well, you know, so we'll see what kind of mood the volatile one is in today. So, ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, a man that you can find throughout the Midwest plying his trade better or as good as anybody else, the one, the only, the volatile one, Curtis Wilde. Welcome, Welcome to the wild side. Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Man, I got to tell you, you did a much better job with the introduction this time than you did last time, but you left out a few things. You left out that I'm the Lion of the Lou, I'm the Wolf of West County, the Spark of Forest Park, the Pharaoh of Fairgrove, and the <laughs> Emperor of Elden. Oh, uh, Tyler Curtis Wild. Okay, I'm, I'm going to make a note for next time. <laughs> I'm going to make some notes here. Also add in there the king of SICW. Uh, okay, hold on a second now. Curtis, you know how I like to shoot. I like to shoot straight from the hip. How is it? I know you've been very active with SI. You've been very successful, but you're not the champion. So explain to me how, that, how you're the king of SICW without having that strap over your shoulder. Who says I'm not the champion? Who says I'm not the champion? All, all of my wild heads out there, all of my wild siders, they know who the real champ is. They know who the man is. That paper champion, Chris Hargis, is just holding the belt for me. So, so is he just keeping it warm? Is he just keeping it nice and nice and tucked away till you're ready to... He's keeping to... my throne warm. <laughs> That's exactly right, Renee. He's just keeping my throne warm. Well, well listen, speaking of thrones, you've got quite a challenge before you uh, coming at, up against uh, Moondog Rover, okay? And you heard probably as you were sitting on hold, I'm wondering what in the heck is going on with Herb Simmons and Larry Matisic? How do they allow Wildfire to be a referee in one of your matches? Because to me, it smells to the high heavens. The fact is, is that it was their idea. You see, it was their idea. They came up with this master plan to try to, to get me confused, to try to get Wildfire confused, and to try to get a, a wedge driven between us because he knows that together we're the most powerful force that FICW has ever seen. But the fact of the matter is, this thing with Moondog Rover, uh, Wildfire's got a thing for abuse of animals. <laughs> and, and, and she is completely against it. I don't know what that's about. I try to buy her first. She gets the tag to me. 
but she's been saving Moondog Rover over the last few months, and nobody really knows where her allegiance lies. I, I know exactly that she's going to come home to me at the end of the day, but right now she's kind of figuring things out. She doesn't know exactly where she's at uh, mentally, but I think after June or uh, July 15th, her mind's going to get set right. So one has to ask, since you are facing Moondog Rover, how is it exactly that you ended up in the quote-unquote doghouse with the lovely Wildfire? As far as I'm concerned, she's in the doghouse. Really? <laughs> wow. Wow. If, if we had a couch that, that I would allow anyone to sleep on, and nobody touches my furniture, by the way. If I had a couch that anybody was allowed to sleep on, that's where she would be. But until then, she can stay in the doghouse. Jeez, Louise. Curtis, well, you know, just when I think you're starting to turn a corner, you say something like that, and all I can do is just shake my head over here, man. All I can do is, is shake my head over here. Well, the here. fact of the matter is, is that the only thing that she's going to do is get jealous. When she sees the women hanging off of me, when she sees me gallivanting all over town, living the death set lifestyle that she's used to living, and she's got a shop for dog leashes. And uh, what was that? I, I think that there may be a drug nearby, as a matter of fact. But she's got a shop for collars and things of that sort, which she's used to shopping for top-of-the-line things. She's used to shopping for the nicest clothes. And I'm just not giving that to her right now. So my, she's just going to have to earn it. And if she doesn't call it right down the middle, which means I win. <laughs> right down the middle. Then she's going to stay in the doghouse. Man, hey, always, always bold words from Curtis. Well, Curtis, switching topics here just, just for a moment. You recently debuted at another promotion, at New Breed Wrestling. And uh, it was a much anticipated debut because I know that's something that you guys had been working on for a little while. Tell us a little bit about making the trip down to New Breed and how that worked out for you. Well, I mean, they, Kevin Nash says... It's all about money and miles, right? So if you've got the money, I'll drive the miles. And that's how that works out. But uh, New Breed Wrestling's got a good thing going on down there. And, you know, I, I haven't quite figured out the lay of the land yet. We've only done a few shows there. But once we, we figure out the lay of the land and Wildfire comes around uh, and realizes exactly where her allegiances lie, then we'll be on top of New Breed Wrestling just like we're on top of SICW because... SICW, every fan that goes to their shows knows that it doesn't matter if I'm the first match, the fourth match, or the last match. I'm the main event. Well, you know what? It's hard to argue that because no matter where you are on the card, there's one thing that's for sure you're going to hear from Curtis Wilde no matter who the opponent is. And I think that's one of the reasons that whether people love you or hate you, they're always on the lookout for what Curtis Wilde is doing. But one has to ask themselves, how did Curtis Wilde come to be? So let's start off by asking you this question. Powerhouse Championship Wrestling. What can you tell me about Powerhouse, man? Bring, 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 shed a little bit of light on that because I know um, that, that was one of, uh, one of the promotions that you had a great deal of success in. Well, it was uh, one of those promotions that, that you hear about uh, where, you know, guys drive – four hours to a place in a rickety old building with no heat and no air conditioner uh, and train for four hours and uh, you know, just keep doing it. Um, that building probably should have been condemned. <laughs> uh, but it was just people who, it was just people who wanted it bad enough uh, to do that. So yeah, we drove four hours and we would train four or five hours and then drive back four hours uh, and did it over and over again and before you know it they ended up putting me on shows and I was on shows with guys like Jimmy Jacobs um, I don't know if, if anybody remembers uh, Cameron Cage who's a GCW guy um, but there, there was a lot of talent that came out of that particular uh, area at Tweak and Dash Phoenix were a couple guys that I trained with 
Um, and they went on to, to wrestle for Burt Prentice and some other bigger organizations, Randy Ricci. Um, wrestled all, all around the Chicago area. Uh, my first championship was the Powerhouse Championship Wrestling my Heavyweight Champion, so that shows you how far I split. I'm a heavyweight now. <laughs> <laughs> by choice, by choice. No doubt, and, and, and I think you're being a little modest here because... You know, just knowing knowing you uh, as well as I do, I would have assumed that you would have immediately reminded everyone that you actually did defeat Jimmy for uh, the light heavyweight championship. That's true. That's true. I did defeat uh, Jimmy Jacobs for the PCW light heavyweight championship. And Brandon Bishop, who was a big name in Chicago at the time, um, for my first heavyweight title, which was the Wicked Wrestling Alliance heavyweight championship. Well, you've definitely come a long way over the years, uh, uh, Curtis. And, and I'm going to ask you this question, kind of, uh, kind of opposite of kind of what our interaction has been up to this point. I'm asking more Chris than I mean Curtis versus you know Curtis Wild. You have been able to do what many can't do. A lot of guys uh, with a different build, uh, different look. Uh, you know, guys that you would automatically assume, oh, that guy's you know going to be a huge success because of the way that he looks and 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 all that. But you uh, have been able to accomplish what a lot of those guys haven't, and that's to have longevity in this business. So there's got to be some keys. I mean, I, I imagine at this point you could almost write a book on it. But there's got to be some keys to your success because. You've worked for a lot of great promotions and had success in almost all of them, but here you are still, and there's something to that. And I'm curious, as a relatively new wrestling fan, I mean, what is it? What are those keys that have allowed you to do it this well for this long? Well, uh, you know, charisma can't really be taught. It's just something that you either have or you don't. And I rely heavily on that. Uh, always have my entire career. And it wasn't honestly until recently that I realized it, but uh, I think it led to more longevity is the whole less is more concept uh, and, and being able to work smarter and not harder, uh, being able to, um, you know, not do as much athletically, uh, but still be able to entertain a crowd. They'll be able to take them on an emotional roller coaster, um, and you know you brought up guys that that may not look the part and things like that. But I rely heavily on uh, guys that that laid the road before me. So I look at guys like Dusty Rhodes or Jerry Lawler or Wahoo McDaniel, uh, Arn Anderson. You know, guys that that were really great at playing off the emotion of a crowd. And if you can concentrate on shaping the emotions as you're going uh, live and in living color uh, for a lot of crowds, then you can do that your whole life. <laughs> you know? And, <laughs> and Yeah, and charisma never goes out, out of style, that's for sure. The thing you got to be careful of is just not getting injured in the process. And I still like to, I mean, I'm 37 years old and I still hit a, a trouble in paradise. And I still hit, uh, every now and again, missile drop kicks off the top rope and things that I probably shouldn't be doing, but I want to. You know, I still, I still want to do that because I'm still capable of doing those things. And it, it kind of shocks people that try to judge a book by its cover that I can do some of the things that I do. Um, and that plays into the, the whole thing. That, that plays into the longevity is that I just got to do one of those things during a match. And it, it, that's what people are going to talk about. Pulling the curtain back, that's what it is, man. Well, well, I think that as much as guys work on their bodies, uh, there is definitely... Uh, <laughs> There's definitely something to be said about charisma and the ability to capture people's attention, whether you want them to like you or want them to hate you. Uh, and I know you've you've had success doing both, both as a baby and as a face. 
Um, I, I guess I have to ask kind of like the old boring question. Do you have a preference on how you work? Because I know you have the ability to do both. Uh, in recent years, I really like the uh, rule breaker uh, situation because I control the pace of a match. Um, again, I can work smarter, not harder. Um, I can work off the crowd a lot more. I can work the referee. And to be honest with you, when I was, uh, you know, baby face and, and trying to get the adulation of the crowd, uh, it's harder to work. <laughs> it's harder to work to get people to like you. You know, and especially when you don't look like a bodybuilder and you don't look like uh, the typical six foot ten Vince McMahon knockoff. Um, it, it's harder work to get people to like you. So I, I spent a lot of energy during my entrance <laughs> when I was a baby face. You know what I mean? I, I would come out there, and a lot of people can look at it and realize that, that uh, some of the advice that I give younger guys played to what I was doing back then because younger guys will be like, you know, I, I know the moves and I know how to how to do this and I can do, you know, some really cool stuff and I'm really athletic, but how do I how do I get the crowd involved like you do? And I'm like, man, you need to watch some rock concerts. You know? <laughs> like, That's great advice. You need to really pay attention to to performers. Uh, people who enthrall their audience. Look at some Bon Jovi. Look at some some uh, Metallica, some Guns N' Roses, and watch these guys suck the audience in. And and you'll learn some things from that. You know, it's not just wrestling. It's not just about doing the moves. It's about entertaining a crowd because that crowd pays to see you. And if that crowd pays to see you, then you better give them all you got. Yeah, and you know what? Something comes to mind as I hear you say that. You think about guys that don't even speak the language. Uh, Shinsuke Nakamura, and I don't know how much you follow WWE these days, but everybody knows who that is. That ability to to capture people, I think, is a lost art in a lot of ways. I mean, you look at a guy, and I hate to keep referencing WWE guys, but you look at a guy like Dolph Ziggler. Seems to have all the charisma in the world. Seems to have all the physical talent in the world. But... Whatever that it factor is, he appears to have it, but just not enough of it. You know what I mean? And he's done really, really well. Not, you know, who the hell am I criticizing a guy that's had that much success? But there's a reason that he doesn't get the same reaction as a AJ Styles or a Shinsuke Nakamura. You either have it or you don't. And or like I'm, Kevin Owens. Or like Kevin Owens. That's a great example. That, that's an absolutely great example because some guys, I mean... My favorite part of SmackDown is when it's over and talking smack comes on. And even then, Kevin Owens especially is is so dynamic and he almost makes you want to hate him for real because of what a jerk he comes out as. And he 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 provokes that emotion even in me that I'm just like, okay, I you know, all of it is, you know, it is what it is, but I'm just like this guy's such a jerk, you know, he's in there being mean to Renee Young or whatever, so it's definitely an interesting dynamic, and, and there's no question that when you say, hey, I may not have the championship, but I'm the reason people come to SICW, I can't argue with you, man, because I'm looking forward to going to SICW before the end of the year, and one of the people that I'm dying to see in action just once again is Curtis Wild. Right on. Right on. Right on, right on indeed. It's a whole different experience, seven on through to the Wild Pack. <laughs> that Dolph Ziggler does have all the tools, man. Dolph Ziggler does have a look and, and a whole lot of charisma and a whole lot of energy, and he knows uh, exactly when to hit certain things. Uh, but he, he doesn't doesn't break that mold. Uh, I I feel like he's still kind of in a mold, um, and it, it's that mold that a whole lot of guys came in through, where where they all look kind of cookie cutter. And it was all just boots and pads and, uh, you know, the, the little tight spandex shorts. Um, and a whole lot of guys came in around that time. And those guys have one at a time fallen off. Um, but then you got guys like Kevin Owens, who's probably going to be around for years. You got guys like Bray Wyatt, who's probably going to be around for years. And it's because they know how to connect with an audience. You don't have to look like a cut-up bodybuilder in order to be able to invoke an emotion in an audience. 
and that's what this business is all about. And no, no doubt about it. Well, hey, Joe, I know you've been listening, man, uh, a little anxious to try to jump on here. Uh, I know that you've look, you're looking forward to coming back out to Kansas City uh, maybe, you know, in the next couple of weeks for SummerSlam. And I know SICW is one of the promotions you've been wanting to go to. But then again, that's not the only place Curtis works. But why don't you go ahead and jump in, man? I know you had at least a question that you wanted to ask. I do. I do. Um, Curtis, what do you hope that the fans get out of watching a Curtis Wilde match? Well, I, I don't really hope that they get anything. I know what they're going to get. They're going to get everything I got on that day. They're going to get me pouring my soul into that ring, whether it's win, lose, or draw, whether I'm a, a good guy or a bad guy, whether they love me or hate me. I'm going to give them the best oh. show that I possibly can that day. Good answer. Good answer. Um, my second question, if you were able to wrestle any professional wrestler alive or dead, who would that be? I know Very it's a long. tough question. Jerry Lawyer. That's, that, that was a very, very... Why uh, would you want to wrestle Jerry Lawyer? It's my bucket list. Uh, I did some growing up just outside of Memphis in Horn Lake, Mississippi. Uh, when I mm-hmm. was 10 for about two or three years. Um, and he was the guy that was on top down there. It was Jerry Lawler was the legitimate king of Memphis. And Point Lake, Mississippi is about 20 minutes from where they did TV tapings for USWA every week. Uh, and it was about 15 minutes from the Mid-South Coliseum where they had their big, you know, WrestleMania-type shows. Uh, mm-hmm. WrestleMania for, for a kid that age at that time frame, this was, you know, uh, 89, 90 to 92 or, or so. Um, and, I mean, going to the USWA TV tapings and seeing Jerry Lawler in person was probably one of the, the biggest experiences that drove me into this wrestling business. Um, at least locked the door and, and decided <laughs> it wasn't going to let me out. <laughs> um, but, yeah, it was a great time, man, when Hodge Cup Eddie Gilbert was down there and uh, Bill Dundee, Jeff Jarrett was like a 17-year-old kid still opening doors for the fans when they wow. got to the arena. <laughs> when they got to the uh, TV taping, he was still opening doors for the fans. So, okay. and, it was and a, a dust my, last question, my, my, my last question before I throw it back to Renee, how do you feel that professional wrestling has changed over the years? Well, I think there's uh, wrestling at its core has kind of lost its way. Uh, I don't think that it's the same professional wrestling that it used to be. Old school wrestling mm-hmm. didn't have the veil pulled off. So uh, the fans, exactly. Uh, you know, still, still bought into what was going on, but that's our job now. It's just been the disbelief. Now that everybody's had the veil pulled back, it's our job to, uh, during that show, suspend that disbelief and make them believe in what's going on, make them, them you know, enthralled in the situation. Um, and sometimes it does cloud those those things, you know, like the thing with me and Wildfire and Moondog Grover. You never know, you know. Uh, sometimes there's gray areas between real life and, and pro wrestling, but... Uh, the other thing, the other difference I see with pro wrestling is there's a lot more entertainment available now. So uh, it, it's really tough to get people into live shows um, when they can watch a show from Japan on their phone um, for free, you know? So the fact that there's so much entertainment uh really hurts the independent wrestling scene. And I'll always hope that there's going to be another Territories uh, situation popping up, that the Territories will revive, um, because that's really, really my prime time when I would have liked to have been a wrestler was during the Territory days. Um, But I don't see that, that happening, so... The thing that's going to have to happen is that the easily accessible entertainment is going to have to kind of get boring again 
and people are going to have to want to go to live entertainment. Live show. Which is kind of starting to happen because people are starting to realize that you can go out and see a wrestling show for 40 bucks and the cost of popcorn and a beer um, instead of taking people to the movies for 100 bucks a pop for a family. Yeah, no doubt, because last time I went to the movies, I had to, like, take out a small loan from the bank. That's not a joke. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> well, let me let me ask you this question before we go into the final segment, uh, Curtis. We were talking about this a little bit earlier with a couple of guys you're probably familiar with. We were talking with Luke Roberts, uh, Ben Simon, and Drew Abenhaus. And the question that basically I threw out there was, um, you know, the recent news of NWL closing up shop in STL. They're kind of repackaging it and moving it or whatever. There was a lot of conversation after that news was broken that part of the reason that they hadn't succeeded was because St. Louis, as, as a wrestling market, was very inclusive and that in some cases it was toxic. Um, see, I, I happen to disagree with that narrative because if it was, why would there be... What in the world is that? What in the world was that? Okay, sound guy, way too early on the Wrestle Talk Podcast Game Show Challenge. Put yourself in timeout right now because that was bullcrap. Okay, let me finish my damn question. Anywho. That guy was ready with that music, but he gave me no entrance music on the way in. I have no idea. The amount of disrespect going towards, towards, towards Curtis Wilder tonight is absolutely uncalled for. Hey, we'll get this resolved next time you come on. Sound guy. <laughs> We're gonna, the sound guy's in timeout now. He can't hear you. Listen, so let me finish my question. The narrative has been, I think you heard the majority of it, that the St. Louis wrestling scene is very inclusive, in some cases toxic. I tend to disagree because why and how could there be 8 to 12 successful promotions in the area? My question is, where do you come off on that? Have you found that the St. Louis, St. Louis wrestling scene is different than in other places that you've worked, or do you believe that's maybe just somebody, you know, sucking on some sour grapes? Well, um, I, I actually have two answers to that. Um, <laughs> one, yes, the St. Louis area wrestling scene is highly inclusive um, and doesn't really like outsiders, and I can speak to that personally because uh, when I first started, I lived on the other side of Illinois, um, and I wrestled probably four or five years and was traveling all over. I mean, I did do some shots in Missouri. Um, I was doing triple shot weekends almost every weekend, traveling around, hitting uh, two to three states every weekend. And then I ended up moving to St. Louis, um, which killed a lot of those bookings, but also had a scene that was like, if you're an outsider, you're not really welcome. Um, and it's not so much that way anymore uh, that I know of because I can't say I, I, I'm already here so I really don't know how easy it is <laughs> you're already in but in, in the St. Louis area uh, I'm already here I'm already comfortable with my schedule I'm not actively trying to get booked anywhere else um, so I really don't know how tough it is to get booked here but I know when I first got down here, there was a lot of clicks going on. Um, and I think that, that Herb was one of the better guys in the area, for sure, on bringing in out-of-area guys and giving them a shot and giving the crowd uh, something different to see from time to time. Um, from all over, I've already, I've already seen it, you know, like Congo Kong, guys like that that have come in and kind of a treat for the crowd and and then Herb switches it out and tries other people and gives the crowd a chance to see other people. But uh, on the other hand, um, that's that's locker room stuff. Um, is St. Louis inclusive as a business? No, I don't think it is. I think that if you're a good promotion and 
uh, you're doing all the right things to make sure that the fans know that you're there for them and you want them there for you, then they'll come. It's kind of a, if you build it, they will come community, but you have to promote yourself. And you can't attempt to take brands that have already had some success in the area and repackage them in the same area and expect to have some sort of success. They're not the same brand. It would be like trying to make Curtis Wild something else. It's just not going to work. Yeah, and I think that was probably one of the bigger parts of it. You know, you you take a Fitchett and Vega or a Dirty Jake Durden and you try to make them something else. And, yeah, the people just aren't buying it. And like Drew said, you know, people, let's like just say. Outlaw. Yeah, and Mike Outlaw, you know, people that were going to Anarchy were like, we like this, it feels like ECW, and then you go, hey, don't worry about it, we're going to give you something better, it's shinier, it's brighter, and then they go, no, 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 we don't want shinier and brighter, we want what we had, and then you take that away from them and people tend to get a little upset, but um, for the sake of time, let's do this, Intern Tim, you can come out of timeout now, we're going to get into the Wrestle Talk Podcast Game Show Challenge where yours truly, the Night Owl, gets to go one-on-one with the volatile Curtis Wilde. At this point, no idea what the topic is. It's a trivia. Whoever guesses first, shouts it out first, uh, gets the point. I think it's like best out of three or whatever. So, intern Timmy, don't screw it up this time. Hit the music. Let's get into it. <laughs> All right, ladies and gentlemen, it is now time for the Russian Talk Podcast Game Show Challenge. This week's challenge is going to be called Let's Get Wild. All of these answers will have the word wild connected with their name. I'm going to give you a clue, and all you have to do is just answer the, the first person that answers the question, gets the point, will play to three points, whoever wins, gets to uh, the, uh, the uh, Russell Pod- Rush Talk Podcast Game Show song played for them. Do you gentlemen understand? Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm ready to take... I'm ready. I'm ready to take on Curtis Wilde. Let's do this. Okay. The first question: This bad man in WCW became a wild man. Wild man in Mark the w- You would be correct. Damn it! Curtis Wilde has one point. Renee Martinez, the Night Owl, has none. The second question: What was the name? Tag team of Tracy Smothers and Steve Armstrong in the NWA. I will say that they are it's the blank eyed the blank eyed southern boys. Wild eyed southern boys would be correct. Right on the tip of my tongue. We've had Tracy Smothers on the show. All right. You know what? That's fine. He won. Let's just go to the last one. I gotta redeem myself with the last question. Okay. Damn it. The name of the WWE Hall of Famers, Alpha and Seekers. The Wild Samoans. Wild Samoans. Wild Samoans. Wild Samoans. I, I got it first. No way. <laughs> I Rip believe Harvey. I heard Curtis. Damn it. I got swept by the volatile Curtis. Wow, this is some bull crap. Man, go ahead and play the music while I sit over here and cry in the corner. I'm going to the corner now. It's swept with a... <laughs> you forget, man. I've been wrestling for a long time, but I've been following wrestling for about 32 years. Dude, here's what's crazy. I knew the answers. You just beat me to them, bro. You're you're quicker with the trigger. What can I say? <laughs> All right, play the music. Let's 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 let's, let's do it. <laughs> Yeah. All I do is win, 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 no matter what. Got money on my mind, I can never get enough. And every time I step up in the building, everybody has no up. And they stay there, and they stay there. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, really? Oh, really? Y'all are playing the auto-tune baby cry for me just because I... Come on, man. Give me some credit. <laughs> That's messed up. Enter TV. Your ass is about to be fired. I'm telling you right now. 
That's not right, man. All right. <laughs> Curtis, we know you got a big show coming up, man. Plug that thing. Tell people how they can follow you on social media, man. And promise we can do this again some other time. July 15th, SICW at the East Ronda Lake Community Center. It's going to be me and Moondog one-on-one with Wildfire as the special guest referee. Nobody knows where she stands right now, so she's supposed to call it right down the middle. And I'm thinking that she might lean towards Moondog, and if that's the case, it may be Curtis Wild versus Moondog Rover and Wildfire, July 15th at the East Ronda Lake Community Center. And then we've got the classic championship match, of course, with the icon Chris Hargis and Travis Cook uh, going against a former champion, uh, Heath Hatton, and whoever wins of that is just going to hold my championship until I get there. But for right now, i got to handle this thing with Moondog Rover, with Wildfire, and i got to make sure that I hold it down on the wild side. No. And July 1st, July 1st, I'm going to be making a special guest appearance at the uh, River City Rascals Stadium uh, in O'Fallon, Missouri. I think it's St. Peter's, actually. Uh, Missouri, and uh, it'll be me and some of the other SICW wrestlers making an appearance uh, with the Shriners for a uh, show that we're going to be doing. We're going to be part of a Shriners benefit concert September 15th, uh, and we're going to be bringing SICW to St. Charles, Missouri on September 30th. But the next thing you need to remember is July 15th, and July 1st, we're going to be at the River City Rascals uh, Car Shield Stadium. And then July 15th, it's going to be Curtis Wild against Moondog Rover, Wildfire, special guest referee. I get a feeling you got something up your sleeve. Curtis, I know you're not going to tell us, but you're a man that always has a plan. And I have a feeling. I got a sneaky suspicion that you got something up your sleeve. But people will have to tune in on the 15th, SICW. Wrestling Explosion. They've been around this long for a reason, folks. I'm going to try to make it out there before the end of the year. Not going to promise because, you know, life, family, and all that. But I'm going to make every effort that I can to go out there. Curtis, it's been an honor and a pleasure, sir. Looking forward to doing this with you again and uh, break a leg or something. All right. Have a good one, Renee. Joe, it's been Wrestle Talk Gets Wild. Have a good one, gentlemen. Boom. What? Absolutely. All right, Joe, close it out, man. Awesome show tonight. Uh, absolutely, it was. It, it was a great, 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 great show. Um, I I don't know what the hell Intro and Timmy was doing playing that, that, that song, but we're going to have a long discussion. And then he hit the cr- and then he hit the the auto tune crybaby on me, bro. What the hell? <laughs> like this dude's got some balls. I'll tell you that much. All right, guys. Hey, every Wednesday, seven p.m. right here on the home of the Wrestle Talk Podcast. www.wrestletalkpodcast.com. We are officially in the air everywhere. We'll catch you guys in a week, man. Grace and peace to everybody. And Perry Hartman, get well soon. We are out. Really? Again?